welcome to the Blues Television Network. I'm Chef Laura and we are not cooking at the moment, we are going to make ourselves a great cocktail. We've got summer coming up here and so let's make something fun for the summer. Uh, we've got this mint melon gin from Prohibition Spirits right up the road here in Sonoma County. And we've got some melon, so I've got some Crenshaw melon and some cantaloupe. And we're going to make a mint melon cocktail. There's a couple ways to do it. Um, I'm going to make the um, I'm going to make it my fancy way. But what we're going to do is we're going to take. So I took the melon and I made some melon balls. Just got a melon scooper. Um, we wanted something really visually appealing, so we have both yellow. So we've got both color melons. And what we're going to do is we're going to start just by muddling. So I have some mint in there, and I'm just going to put a couple of the melon balls in there. And I've got a couple of leaves of mint in there, and we are going to muddle it, which means we're just going to smash it around just to get out the flavors of the melon and combine the melon and the mint. We've got that smashed around. All right. And we're going to put in a little bit, or maybe a lot, depending on how your day went, of some gin. So this is actually mint melon infused gin, so it's already got a little bit of that flavor in it, but we're just going to add a little more. So um, you can measure, or not, but I'm gonna put in about two ounces of gin for me. And, uh, and then we're going to add some uh, ice. I'm just gonna shake it up. And We've got ourselves a great cocktail. So this is one way to do it. So I'm pouring in the gin. It's been infused with the mint and the two different melons. And we're going to add a little bit of sparkling to it. Give it a little fizz. And then if you want to make it a little fancier, we are going to add, um, you can skewer a melon ball, a little kick. Maybe put a mint leaf on it. This is great for, great for the summer by the pool or out at a barbecue. So we've got our little, um, our little skewer. And we've got a great cocktail right there. Another way you can do it is um, just put it in a Collins glass with some ice and a straw and um, enjoy it by the pool. Or another way to do it, since uh, we're gonna be outside now in the summer, hopefully more, what I, what I, one way I recommend is to take all the melon balls and freeze them, fill up a mason jar, and then pour some gin in it. And there you've got your, your cocktail to go. So just a few ideas for a, a, a bright, light, fun, refreshing summer cocktail. Cheers. Oh, that's good. Oh, it's delicious. Perfect for a summer day, summer party, barbecue, have some friends over, and have your mint melon Collins. Tune in for more cocktail tips from the Blues Television Network. Cheers. Be coming, zooming in live to be with us to show us her famous biscuits. Um, so we are gonna get started. Um, Regina, welcome. Thank you so much for doing this. Oh, you're welcome. Hi, Laura. So good to be with you. And my favorite city, San Francisco. Love it. So San Francisco misses you. We miss oh, your okay. blues. We miss San Francisco. So we miss your blues. We miss everything. <laughs> but I do love being back home in Natchez. So it's been a great, it's been a great time to be here. So, so um, tell us. So you've got such an interesting background. Um, you started out in Natchez, and then. Somehow you went to Paris via Alaska. So how did that transition? Well, I grew up in Natchez, and uh, I always say I attended several Southern universities. I had a better time at each one. And my senior year, I went with a group of friends to Alaska with the idea of saving money to uh, 
to come back for my senior year. Well, I got there and um, I called my parents, you know, there, of course there was no Skype and no Zoom and no cell phones and uh, internet. That was 1977. And I called my mother and I said, I have the best news. Uh, I'm not coming back to finish school. I've taken a job in the bush of Alaska cooking for eight men at a construction camp. And I'm going to save money and go to cooking school in Paris. Well, they were not thrilled, but there wasn't a lot she could do. There were no e-tickets. And uh, so I did it and it turned out to be a great experience. And I cooked in a place called Igiagig and Chignik Lake and Kakanak. And I worked hard and saved some money and then um, went to Paris. And right before I went, I met my husband, uh, his girlfriend at the time was sweet enough to introduce the two of us and we've been married 39 years. So it worked out. But um, anyway, just, that was a great experience. And, but you know, what's interesting is uh, now I've kind of gone back to French cooking because when, but when I moved to San Francisco, I went back to my Southern roots and uh, Regina's at the Regis and, Shishi Beignet and everything had a Southern flair. And then of course, 25 years ago, I opened Biscuits and Blues and uh, Stephen Soon is the owner now. And uh, he's trying really hard to get it reopened after they've had so much problem with the Jack in the Box flood and now COVID, but uh, he's, I know he'll get it open. He's very committed to preserving the blues, but I'm very proud that I started something that has sustained blues for 25 years in the Bay Area. It was such and a- I'm looking across the street, I'm at Regina's Kitchen and my wine bar is behind me, but directly across the street is Biscuits and Blues. I helped my brother open a Biscuits and Blues here 22 years ago. Oh, fantastic. So I see Biscuits and Blues every day out my front window, but- Oh, how wonderful. So um, our founder of Blues Television Network, uh, performed many times at Biscuit and Blues, oh. our own E.C. Scott. She's fabulous. I love her to death. And what a great connection when you call. This is great for me. And talk about a walk down memory lane. And I mean, she always drew a crowd and she was with us in the beginning and, you know, has hung in there with us for years. And I'm so glad to see the Blues still so alive in the Bay Area. It is, it is because of her. So, well, you know, when she first called me about doing a show, she said, you've got to make Regina's biscuits. They are unlike anything you've ever had. So to finally be doing this is, is so exciting. Well, and I always say my biscuits are a combination of growing up in Natchez, Mississippi, and then going to school in Paris because I learned the technique of laminating. And, you know, it's, it's funny, I said, when I started cooking French food, my southern roots would kind of creep into some dishes. You know, I can't, some ingredients like corn and pecans that are not typically French, but I'd find a way to work them in there. And then when I started making my biscuits, um, I had never made a biscuit until I was in France, which is funny. Oh, you never made them at home? I never had to make a biscuit in Natchez. Everybody around me made them. And we had them, you know, every morning for breakfast and many times for dinner. But that was the first time I made it. And so that French technique of uh, laminating, because I was learning how to make croissants and different pastries, just kind of creeped its way into my southern roots of, you know, I knew i had seen biscuits made thousands of times. I knew I could do it. But then the technique developed and, and the whole technique, and we'll talk about it, and it's unusual. My recipe is unusual. And it's been, it's kind of a reflection of my life and travels. The uh, margarine, you know, when I grew up, biscuits were made either with lard and then Crisco. And uh, Alberta Fitzgerald, who cooked at my house, who was a great cook, would make it and she would put little chips of butter in them for a little richness. And so when I went to make them for the first time in Paris, I couldn't find Crisco and I found margarine. And I did three parts margarine, one part butter, and they came out so good. It's still the original recipe I did 40 years ago for the first time. You know, I was able to find buttermilk. I was able to find baking powder. So my recipe, and I'm sure you'll post it, is 
you know, four cups of flour and a quarter cup of sugar, a quarter cup of baking powder. And then I take three sticks of margarine or three quarters of a pound of margarine and I cut them into thirds, big chunks. And, um, and we'll come back and talk about, the, um, we'll talk about margarine a little bit down the road here. But I cut the margarine in big chunks and then the butter is firmer and I cut the butter into tiny pieces. So I just little, I did little half inch dice. Yes, that's fine. Perfect. Okay. Great. And then it's interesting because the tea towel came later and was for me a game changer because I used to make them and they made such a mess on the counter. And I had a lovely lady, Janet Tyler, who was my assistant for 14 years at Twin Oaks. And every time I'd cook and make a mess, she would clean up. And one day we were having a party and I decided, oh, I need to make some more biscuits. And there was kind of this sigh, like, I hate this job and I'm so going to quit if she makes another mess. And I went and got a tea towel and made them on the tea towel to not make a mess. But what was great about it is I wasn't touching the dough so the fat stayed colder and I was able to use the towel to, I would roll and use the towel to fold and turn to do my eight folding and turns, which we'll, you'll learn about. So anyway, it's just been an evolution of 40 years of biscuit making that. And then 14 ounces of buttermilk. All right. And I put everything in. Yep. And I did stir the dry ingredients for just a second. Okay, I'm gonna, I'm right behind you. So yeah, I'll, 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 I'll up. And then I'm putting the sugar in. And now, Regina, I did them all by weight because your recipe has um, both yes. and it also has grams. You can do by weight. And the reason my recipe is so detailed is my sweet friend Kim Severson from the New York Times followed me around and made the, did the recipe. And it's so perfect because I'm not that much of a perfectionist. So I just scoop with a cup. I do four cups and... I use, you know, just the dry measures and do it and 14 ounces of liquid and, you know, and the butter and margarine is already cut into quarter pound sticks. So, so it's well, I had my, I had my ruler out cutting half inch, <laughs> half inch. Right. Yeah, that's good. And what I do, you can get a paint stick from your paint store for free and they're one inch and I use that. So oh, perfect. So you can get your, Sherwin Williams paint stick or perfect. Vintage. Now I saw Gina where you said you um you put the tea towel over it. I do because I'm a sure black. A lot of black. There you go. I see you've got your black on. So I do that. I hold the tea towel over, turn it on low, and one Mississippi, two Mississippi, three Mississippi, four, five, six, seven, Mississippi, eight. Mississippi nine, Mississippi ten. That's it. Okay. So I'm ready. Yeah. I'm this pretty is San Francisco or matches, but <laughs> and so my tea towel, I have the recipe printed on because I do we do a lot of biscuit classes in matches and uh I've had, uh, I had a great, I've got to get the video up on my YouTube channel, but Wanda Sykes came and took a biscuit class. Oh, how fun. Uh, Allison Janney and Ashley Kutcher brought his two children and wow. anyway, I had some fun biscuit classes. But um, so people always come and, you know, want the tea towels. So I just went ahead and printed the recipe on it. All right. So when I made them last night, by mistake, I started to mix it without the buttermilk. And fortunately, after four seconds, I checked it, and then I poured the buttermilk back in, and I think it's, it was still okay. Oh, yeah. But uh, the key, there, there's some things that are really important. One, uh, the margarine, which we talked about. Um, they, they make margarine in tubs. And you know, the other thing is, people just have this thing about margarine. They, they kind of freak out. I call it the purity police and they go, Oh my gosh, no margarine is a terrible thing. 
Well, it, um, it's zero trans fat. It doesn't mean it's healthy, but it's zero trans fat. But if you can't find the Land O'Lake stick margarine that I use, um, I make vegan biscuits for friends and you can use the earth balance or vegan sticks, butter sticks, they are buttery sticks, they call them. And it works I also, I also bought the spread. I just I wasn't sure. Yeah, and the spreads don't work because they're whipped and they're soft and you don't get and, and well as I'm rolling and talking about it, you'll kind of understand why you need the chunks. Okay. So I'm pretty generous with the flour on the tea towel. Sorry, let me catch up. I'm gonna mix so I've got everything in and I count. Oh okay, to I'll wait for you. I count to ten. Count to ten. One San Francisco, two San Francisco. Three, there you go. Okay. Four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Oops. And there it is. Voila. Well, there it is. So the biggest mistake people make is over mixing. Okay. Um, you know, I, I'm from a big family. I have five sisters and three brothers. And wow. there were a lot of biscuits consumed at the Trosclair house growing up. But uh, one of my sisters one day said, oh, uh, you know, I, your biscuits just didn't come out right. And I said, you know, did you do this? Did you do this? Going through the recipe. And I said, did you count to 10? She goes, yeah, but it wasn't enough. And I mixed it again. You don't want to over mix. And it's okay that it looks rough and not mixed. That's a good thing. Yeah. And another thing that I love about the tea towel, and I think it's kind of the Southern Belle in me. I hate getting my hands full of dough. Right. It's just pull it with the tea towel. Oh, um, that was smart, I just did not do that. <laughs> um, what happens if you over mix it? They're not as flaky. Okay. They're not bad. Like I say, if you used the whipped margarine, it's not like you would have a inedible biscuit, but if you're gonna go to the trouble, you want them to be perfect. So, right. So yeah. And then people will ask me all the time, Laura, they'll say, um, what if I don't want to use margarine and I want to use all butter? Well, if you do that, you're going to have a shortbread. They're going to be really crumbly. And they'll say, well, what if I want to use um, Crisco? I go, you know, that's fine. And what if I want to use buttermilk and I want to use milk? I go, that's fine. Just don't call it my recipe. <laughs> it changes put your name on it, but so anyway, if you see how it's kind of rough here and I take the tea towel and pull it together. And there's still big chunks of butter. That's exactly what you want because what we're gonna do is we're gonna roll and fold eight times okay. and that's a process called laminating and that's what's gonna give you the layers for the biscuits. So there's, it's still pretty crumbly. There's some loose flour. Yeah, so just keep, it'll all get incorporated okay. as you roll and fold. Like I've got some little loose around here. Oh, you know what? I said I always forget one thing. How about my rolling pin? I've got one down there. I think I would remember every detail. I said, I feel like I've made as many biscuits as McDonald's has made cheeseburgers. <laughs> Probably more. So to be fairly generous with the flour. Okay. And the other thing is, I never flour my pen. You flour the fat on the biscuits. Why is that? Because it won't stick. You can flour your rolling pin all day, but if it's, getting on, if it's hitting the fat with the buttermilk, it's going to stick. Okay. So flour your fat, not your pin. All right, and then you just start rolling to get, and. So there's big chunks of butter, this is amazing. Yeah, and but you'll watch as we roll and fold eight times, those, what you'll start to see, and we're only at the first roll, and then I take, you take your towel, and bring it in and fold it in thirds and just press the air out. And you know, Laura, the beauty of this recipe is you make, you cut them out and you freeze them. They never go straight into the oven. They are frozen 
right. then they're put in a muffin tin and baked. And so you can always have them if you make them and, you know, you make your biscuits, then you cut them out and freeze them and just take them out whenever you want them. And I love having that luxury at my restaurant. All right. So what I did, fold in thirds and then a quarter turn. Okay. Um, why wouldn't you put it straight into the oven? They'll spread out because of the fat. Okay. And they just don't come out as well. And again, everything was discovered by accident. I used to make them and put them right in the oven. And, and again, not that they were bad, but they looked, they would kind of spread out and they would be real flaky, but they would spread out. They weren't so pretty. Mm -hmm. And then what happened was um, at my restaurant, there was such demand. I had to make them and figure out how to freeze them. But I would take them out, let them thaw a little bit. And then when I would do that, I would, um, one night we were really busy and I didn't have time to thaw them. So I decided to put them in a muffin tin thinking that the heat from the metal would help and they would cook faster. They came out so good then that was like, okay, that's, that's a keeper in the recipe. Oh, I and see. so I always freeze them and cook them that way. And it keeps the shape perfectly. Yeah, it does. And this is only number two. So this is just, to me, when I'm um, in cooking school, this is like making puff pastry. It's the layering. So are we creating right. layers here? It's the same process as laminating, but this is a lot easier than puff pastry, don't you think? Right. Oh, my gosh, much. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So um, I made and some. So for those of you out there, here's some biscuits. Um, <laughs> that I made last night, and I was so proud of myself. Um, uh, I think they came out pretty good, Regina. Sorry, I walked off on you. Uh, I thought okay. I had my phone off. Then. Um, I think I'm, I'm, I'm uh, patting myself on the back for these biscuits that I made. Yeah, they're great. Good job. Thank you. And I'm sorry that I didn't see your text last night till 4 a.m. when my <laughs> daughter, when my daughter Cash, wanted to go outside. <laughs> <laughs> this is also very therapeutic. I it mean, is. Very, it's very repetitive and, and um, oh, very another fun. little thing, Laura, is I flip it because it's always flatter on the bottom side before I okay. roll out after about the second or third time. Okay. And again, I do, you know, you see the big pats of butter. Yeah. But what you'll see, is, and you made them last night, you'll notice the more you roll and fold, those big chunks of butter and margarine turn into a ribbon effect, and that's what's giving you your flaky biscuits. Okay. So by the end of this, we'll, we'll have... Um, well, think of it this layer. way. Eight, you're doing it eight times, eight. and and you know folding in thirds so you've got 24 layers okay and that's what gives it that lift and that beautiful flakiness yes. and people have often commented that it seems like a lot of baking powder but again that is the reason is because it is so heavy in the fat you need that extra lift okay and then the sugar just cuts that metallic taste so got it so you made these at Biscuit and Blues in San Francisco. Oh, yes. And they still do. This has to be the, the most uh, ordered, popular item on the menu, I'm assuming. Yeah. <laughs> I, I ordered it every time I went there. What were some of your favorite memories from Biscuit and Blues? Oh, gosh. Um, oh. It's like, it's like asking you to name your favorite. Yeah. No, I mean, so many Bay Area artists that would play all the time. Of course, EC and Tommy Castro and, um, oh my goodness, uh, I can't believe I'm doing this. But Charles, what was his name? Older Charles Charles and his wife, Ruth, who played with Bonnie Raitt. I'm bad at last names all of a sudden. Anyway, one of my favorite memories is there were very few people that played the club that had like, costume changes and he was an older entertainer and he had these beautiful sparkly jackets and we were in the back while he was playing trying on his clothes and <laughs> <laughs> memories of you know different people that came in um 
during the years to see. Christopher Reeve come in? Christopher did not. Um, I when I knew him, I had Regina's, uh, not Biscuits and Blues at that okay. time, but I knew he and Dana from Regina's at the Regis, okay, great. which was right around the corner. Right, and, uh, great memories there. And he and I. Oh, I guess because we were talking about North Beach. Right, a great memory with him. Uh, we would take the cable car to North Beach and go and play pool at the Savoy Tivoli and, uh, and Tosca and have drinks. And I just love North Beach. My husband and I lived there before we had children. Then we moved out Upper Haight and just great memories of that. I love North Beach. In fact, my favorite dish that I'm doing here at Regina's Kitchen and Natchez is uh, white bolognese, which is a North Beach memory, and chipino. Right, you're famous for your chipino. Yeah, people are loving it, and I just, you know, it's a great memory. The only thing is I wish I could get mussels here. You know, I have to adapt to the Gulf seafood, which is great. We have beautiful wild-caught Gulf shrimp and red snapper, but um, I do love me some mussels and clams in my chipino. And Can we ship them to you? Yeah, I can, you know, you can get anything on Amazon now, but I have to say shipping shellfish is not real comfortable a little yeah that, um, so i lost track of my turns where are we <laughs> you know the funny thing is i think i have to <laughs> i think i'm on number five or six so i'll can you i have the edge i'll kind of tell you i have the edge of knowing by looking at it uh but and you'll get to that you probably can tell but you see it starts getting so much easier to work and and i can look at mine and when you don't have the big chunks you know you're there when you start seeing the ribbon effect can so you can you fold it too many times is it possible to overfold it it's pretty hard to overdo it because you get tired of it at some point you go okay this is enough but, <laughs> but no it's um um so tell us about um twin oaks well, Twin Oaks, we've now sold, we've downsized. Um, but for 19 years, I did cooking class weekends. Uh, it's a historic home. And when I decided to move home to raise my boys, um, I didn't really want to be out of the culinary world, but I wanted to be a, a stay-at-home mom. And um, so I started writing cookbooks. And um, I see you've got Twin Oaks, Regina's Table at Twin Oaks. Right. Which I wrote there. So I wrote cookbooks and I did cooking class weekends. And many of my customers and friends from the Bay Area came through the years to see me and to take classes or just come and hang out for the weekend. Our mutual friend Jody Chase has yes. visited many times and uh, she's overdue for a visit, by the way, if you see her. <laughs> Jody, you're on notice. You're on notice. You're overdue <laughs> for a visit. But it's so funny, we have now moved out of 6,000 square feet into 1,400 little Paris apartment I created. Wow. Because we're hoping to, uh, we've moved, we have a rum distillery that we're moving to New Orleans from Natchez. Oh. So you're also into rum, that's amazing. Yeah, my uh, oldest son, Jean-Luc, and my husband, Doug, um, created Charbonneau Rum, and they do an amazing job. But they're... Um, moving the rum distillery to New Orleans. So we'll probably have a tiny place there and a tiny place here. So, so it's just enough room for me and my husband, Doug, and my dog, Johnny Cash. So, so these are ready. I mean, mine, I can tell by looking, I'm going to fold it. So the, after the eighth time, which I think we're there. I still have some chunks. Is that okay? It's okay. All right. And then... This is where you roll it one inch thick. Okay. Could you make them thicker if you wanted? Um, you know, they, if you get them too thick, they're just, they don't cook as evenly, I think. I love okay. one inch and then a two inch biscuit cutter. Okay. I'm covered in flour here. <laughs> and... I don't know if you can see, but you see all those layers? I'm sure you're getting the same thing. Yeah. yeah. But that's what you're looking for. Okay, great. 
And if it has a little chunk of butter in there, that's fine because cooking it in the muffin tin, it will uh, absorb, it'll, if some of the fat drains out of the biscuit, it'll get reabsorbed by cooking it in the muffin tin. Okay, great. So that's why you have those wonderful flaky biscuits, you know, nice and crispy on the bottom. And so there's all those layers. Yeah, see? Yeah, that's just going to, that, that'll give it that flaky, those beautiful flaky textures. But let me tell you what else I do, Lauren. I don't know if we talked about this. Um, one of my best, well, my best seller at King's Tavern, my other restaurant matches, where we had the rum distillery, and then we were in the oldest building, and I had a restaurant. We just, with COVID, we've closed that. We've moved out of Twin Oaks. We've just made major changes. And at my age, I didn't want to try to restart everything. And uh, I love Regina's Kitchen. I have the restaurant and wine bar and the cooking school, and it's on Main Street, and I walk to my new little place. It's great. But uh, my most, one of my most popular dishes there, we had a wood-fired oven, and I make a chicken pot pie with a bacon thyme biscuit crust. So I take biscuit dough and add bacon and fresh thyme and roll it out thin and top a pot pie. So you put the, um, do you put the cheese into the mix, into the dough when you're mixing it or after? I do it, I, uh, you can do it a bunch of different ways, but I usually just, because I'm rolling it out really thin mm -hmm. for a top of the pot pie, I don't leave it thick like a whole biscuit. Okay. I, it's more of like maybe a quarter inch thick. Mm -hmm. I'll press the bacon and thyme into it. And as I, I'll fold it and roll it one time that way. I was gonna ask you about that. If, um, if I wanted to make um, bacon cheddar biscuits, yeah. I, should I just put it on top before we bake? No, let me tell you what you do. Uh, I do that all the time. And you take, uh, think of this, always add dry to dry and wet to wet in your mixture. Mm -hmm. So if I'm doing um, bacon cheddar, I put my cheese and my bacon in the flour mix and mix it first for just a little bit and then add the rest of the ingredients and it's totally incorporated. Another thing that's great with cheddar cheese biscuits is I always put a little bit of dry mustard in my flour, Coleman's dry mustard. With that cheese, it really gives it a great kind of vibrancy. So that's good. But um, yes, yeah, so if I'm doing, we do a white chocolate orange marmalade biscuit as a dessert biscuit here at Regina's. And so what I do there is uh, I add the orange marmalade into the milk. Okay, wow. So it's evenly distributed. And then I add the white chocolate chips to the flour. So think dry, dry, wet, wet. Okay. Makes and sense. you can go crazy with your own ideas of uh, different flavorings and all. And then the other thing, Laura, is when after I've punched out, it's kind of human nature. People want to ball up the dough. You want to stack your dough. Okay. You don't want to lose all those pretty low layers. So I stack it and I'll cut it and stack it. And then, and again, you can't mess it up. It's not like it, you know, you have to do it any particular way, but you just want it smooth and about an inch thick. Okay, so I'm just, I'm cutting up these loose ends and just putting them right on top. Yes. Okay. And that way you're retaining your layers because the last biscuit should be as flaky as the first one. So if you don't overhandle your dough, but it is, I've watched people so many times in my classes, human nature, they want to take dough and like ball it up. It's like, no, no, just be patient. Stand I mean, going back to our childhood youth of Play-Doh. <laughs> I know. <laughs> and really with, Typically, when I do have little ones taking biscuit classes, at some point, we just let the remnants be Play-Doh because that's... Now, do we roll these out? Yes. So I stack it. Well, what you do, yeah. Stack it and flour it and roll it. And if it's not very, if it looks kind of rough, like a lot of seams, I just fold it over until I get a smooth top. Okay. Fold it in half and then roll it to get a smooth top. Okay. But 
the best thing to do is to take about, after I get about two dozen biscuits, I take the leftover and I'll add my bacon and thyme to this. Ah. I'll roll it out thin and make a pot pie. Got it. Or you can add sugar and make shortbread for a, a sweet dessert. And That sounds <laughs> pretty amazing. <laughs> Um, I have a question for you about the flour. Um, your recipe calls for all purpose. Is yeah. there do you have a favorite brand? Is there is there you know, um, because I do cooking classes all over and you know I was in LA and doing the Hallmark channel early in March and is I try to use ingredients that are pretty universal. And um, so I always recommend gold metal all purpose flour. My rule of thumb when I write a cookbook, um, you know, I've got four cookbooks and when I write a cookbook or I'm doing something or Pillsbury all purpose, they're the same company. Okay. Basically, um, is that um, I try, if I can get it at Walmart and Natchez, you can get it anywhere. Right. But yes, uh, there are so many good flowers, but you now people do ask me about unbleached. No, I always use unbleached if I'm making pizza dough, but it's too heavy for the biscuits. I find it all purpose is lighter. Okay. And a cake flour is too light. So uh, Pillsbury gold metal, all purpose. All right, the winner. <laughs> okay, I think I'm gonna get a few more out of here. And then I like your idea of, of the, uh, of the thyme and bacon. Oh yeah, that's so great. And my chicken pot pie, I do a cream sauce with lots of vegetables and mushrooms and tarragon and sauteed chicken breast. And we cooked it in the wood fired oven. It was just great, so. And here at Regina's, I've been doing a cocoa van pot pie. Oh, wow. And doing cocoa van and putting it in pretty little glass. I get these little individual glass uh, pie plates. Oh, and so I do a whole chicken breast and I slice it with the cocoa bath sauce and then the bacon biscuit crust on top. And that is really good. I've done a beef bourguignon pot pie. I do a brisket pot pie. We do a crawfish pot pie. So, and the dough is the hardest part. So it's whatever you have to put your filling in. You can use all kinds of leftovers. I think I'm getting just, I think I'll get it right down to the last one. Yeah, and I always call it the ugly duckling. There comes a point. Yeah. Yeah. I'm gonna have to turn that one upside down. <laughs> All right, so these go into, here's some, so I was nibbling on these last night. Yeah. <laughs> no, was, no, and the other thing is you can get a Ziploc bag and start a bag of leftovers, oh. you know, like last biscuit and just collect enough to do something else with it. Oh, what a great idea. We, so these go in the freezer, right? They go in the freezer. Okay. So we'll freeze them and then okay. um, once they're frozen, I just stick them in the freezer. I don't wrap them with plastic or anything. Okay. Once they're frozen, I put them in a Ziploc bag and then I just pull them out as needed out of a Ziploc bag. So. Okay, and I mean, there's usually, I'm the same way, I have flour everywhere. I mean, I have it all over me, but usually it's all over the counter, but. But in this nice, yeah. Tea towel. Tea towel is such a great idea. So I froze these last night. I just put these right into the muffin tins. Yes, looks great. And so I move the to a 350 degree oven, about 23, 25 minutes. Everybody's oven is a little different, but you can tell. Yeah, mine took about, uh, I, had to, I think mine took about 27. Uh -huh. I set it at 23, and then I added two minutes, and then I added another two minutes. And you have all those nice layers. Yeah, so these guys are going in. On the magic of television. <laughs> <laughs> Voila! <laughs> um, from Mississippi to San Francisco, like that. That's great. Amazing. Regina, thank you so much. You're welcome. Give EC a big hug and kiss for me. And I love the Bay Area. Yeah. So if you're, anybody's visiting Mississippi, don't 
come without coming by to see me. So I miss you all. We miss you. So wait, before you go, um, we can buy your tea towel on your store, right? Yes, reginaskitchen.com. Okay, and then we'll post, we'll post the recipe. And, um, and you have some other things on your, all your books are on your website. Yes, and, and um, cranberry chutney and my jalapeno um, pineapple jam and uh, aprons. My aprons are really cute. My husband came up with the idea because I would always ask him, Google, how many teaspoons are in a cup? How many tablespoons? So it has a little upside down conversion. Oh, a cheat sheet. Oh, that's <laughs> just look at your apron. Oh, that's perfect. A little cheat yeah. sheet. <laughs> I have to have pockets in my apron. So Gina, tell us when, um, when can you reopen? What's the plan? I'm opening July 2nd and we'll do kind of a soft opening. I'll limit my menu. Um, you know, it's still kind of prevalent in Mississippi. I don't think we've reached the peak. So I'm a little cautious about it, but I uh, will reopen in July and probably just open weekends. And then we'll add Thursdays and Fridays and hopefully the whole world will get back to normal soon. Cause I, yeah, it's been a tough time for a lot of people and being in the restaurant business during this. Uh, so many of my friends, you know, we made conscious decisions to not reopen some things. And a lot of my friends uh, just can't, couldn't sustain their businesses during this time. And I'm talking about friends all over the place. And I'm sure you'll see restaurants not opening in San Francisco, friends in New York, Minneapolis, uh, Louisville, Kentucky. I mean, chef friends all over struggling. So, but I'm optimistic that we'll get through this and, um, you know, hopefully we'll get a vaccine and everything will be good again. So. Exactly. Then we can come visit you. Well, it's great to see you, Laura. You too. Thank you so much for being with us. It's such an honor. Hope to see you in Mississippi. Come visit. I will. We all will. Bye. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. I'm going to dig into these now because yeah, there you go. <laughs> I'm dying. <laughs>